After studying this module, you shall be able to understand the key approaches to problem solving and state the difference in trial and error learning and insightful learning. This module will also be helpful in identifying the key methods of problem solving which include the use of algorithms and heuristics to solve problems. You will also come to know about the factors that hinder problem solving. You will also explore how problem solving and brain are linked. In the previous module, you have already studied what is the structure of a problem? You have also read about the distinctions between well-defined and ill-defined problems. In addition to that, the module also acquainted you to the process of problem solving. In this particular task, we will move a step further and identify what are the key approaches to problem solving. Following which, we will look at the strategies that can be employed in solving different types of problems. We will also understand what factors hinder problem solving. We will also explore how brain impacts problem solving. Let us first come to the key approaches to problem solving. Problem solving and thinking as we know are closely intertwined. We already know that the well-defined problems have an initial state a goal state and a path or a set of operators through which the goal state can be obtained. The problem of chess or the Tower of Hanoi involves what is called directed thinking. Such a goal oriented approach to problem solving requires rational thinking and rational decision making. In general, rational problem solving and rational decision makes an individual avoid wandering aimlessly and exploring odd, unachievable options. It channelizes energy in the doable and achievable terms and saves time and manpower. But we are also aware that all problems are not well defined. Ill defined problems, unlike well defined problems, cannot be approached in a straight fashion and eventually solved. A problem can be approached in two different ways. During the early 20th century, the Gestalt psychologist contrasted productive thinking, the idea that was propounded by Wertheimer, and reproductive thinking, the idea that was proposed by Thorndike. When an individual reproduces the response to a given problem based on his or her past experience, it is called reproductive thinking. Reproductive thinking involves arriving at the solution of a problem by taking a tried and true path to the problem. By using rote memory, the thinker reproduces a series of steps that have been tried and tested to yield a workable solution to the problem. In the previous module on operant conditioning, you were familiarized with trial and error behavior as observed by Thorndike. Just to remind a bit, Thorndike in his classic experiment placed a hungry cat in a puzzle box. The cat would escape from the confinement of the box by discovering a lever that opened the door of the box. At first, the cat made random attempts to move out of the box. But once it discovered the escape lever, the cat quickly reproduced the solution to the problem in order to escape from the confinement. Trial and error may be regarded as a form of reproductive thinking. This, however, is not likely to yield out-of-box creative solutions. In the second way, solving the problem requires something new and different to achieve the goal. Here, prior learning is not of help and one has to think something non-obvious to solve the problem. You might have yourself experienced it sometimes that you had been struggling to find a solution to a seemingly never solvable problem. Suddenly, the solution pops up 
and almost all of a sudden this kind of experience is called aha experience. Kohler distinguished between this trial and error learning or thinking and insight based thinking in problem solving. Kohler spent seven years studying the problem solving of chimpanzees. In one of the problems that he designed for the chimpanzees, he placed several crates in the vicinity of a chimpanzee. Hanging on the top of the cage of a chimpanzee is a banana, which the chimpanzee cannot reach. Kohler reported that the chimpanzee seemed to be lost in thought as to how to reach the banana and then seemed to be lost in thought as to how to reach the banana and then suddenly it gets an insight that the crates can be moved and stacked in form of a ladder to reach the banana. The chimpanzee quickly translates this thought into action. You can see this in the picture also. In one of the other problems, the chimpanzee insightfully learned to join the two sticks lined outside his cage in order to reach a banana which was otherwise out of the reach of the chimpanzee. According to Kohler, this insightful problem solving differs from trial and error learning. This type of thinking is called productive thinking which requires insight and creativity. According to Gestalt psychologists, the thinker must see new and novel ways of organizing the problem. This may also require structuring the elements of the thought and perception. It is argued that ill-defined problems often demand productive thinking as its solutions can be achieved through insight. Well-defined problems on the other hand are more likely to be solved through reproductive problem solving. But these are neat formulas for problem solving. Now let us look at some of the general problem solving methods. One of the important goals of research on problem solving has been to identify strategies to use when we are confronted with problems. There are two key methods to problem solving. One is called the algorithms and the other one is called heuristics. Let us discuss these at depth. An algorithm is a rule that correctly generates the solution to a problem given that one can devote sufficient time and effort to applying the rule. Two general algorithms are trial and error and systematic search. You have already read about trial and error in the previous module also. The second method is systematic search. To understand this, consider this example. If one wishes to solve anagrams for C, T, A, an algorithm to solve this will be to try every possible letter in every possible position until the word solution is reached. Thus, in systematic search, every letter in every position in an anagram is tried systematically. This works well for smaller words. But imagine if the word uh, problem would have been uh, applied on a long word, say with alphabets H, A, R, P, O, A, O, A, C, I, N, H, P. If we apply a regular search on this, it will take very long. The answer to this, by the way, is arachnophobia. It will be too daunting a task to attempt solving it going step by step, making each possible combinations of the alphabets. Algorithms are often very time consuming and they make great demands on the working memory and long term memory. This brings us to the second type of search method called heuristics. Heuristic refers to a rule of thumb or a general strategy that may lead to a solution reasonably quickly with less computation cost. Let us revisit the example that we just took. 
heuristic for solving anagram is to look for sequences of letters that occur frequently in English such as ism, ism. The second is to remove rarely occurring combinations and build on the knowledge of how words are combined and put together to make meaningful utterances. Now let us look at the commonly used problem solving heuristics. These include random search, hill climbing, mean sense analysis and using analogies. Let us look at each one of these separately and understand them more closely. Random search is the simplest and cognitively one of the least demanding of all heuristic methods. Here the problem solver randomly picks up a move and tests to see whether the goal state is achieved. You may have observed this when you play the game of cards where cards are laid in the form of a mat and the players have to match similar cards by picking up one card at a time. Often children use random search strategies in matching these cards. This may be due to their cognitive immaturity. Adults also apply random search in a number of situations. Understanding hill climbing is also important. Hill climbing is a knowledge dependent heuristic where the problem solver looks one move ahead and chooses the move that most closely resembles the goal state. A classic problem solving in which the hill climbing heuristic is applied is the water jug task. The problem presents a situation to the problem solver where he or she is provided with three jars of different capacities. Jar A can be filled with 8 ounces of water. Jar B on the other hand can be filled with 5 ounces of water. Jar 3 can be filled with 3 ounces of water. Now the initial state is that jar A is full of water and the problem solver has to pour out water using the jars to arrive at 4 ounces in jar A and in jar B. The jars do not have any graduated lines and therefore one must pour until one either drains the jar or fills up the receiving jar entirely. Here if the problem solver chooses the hill climbing strategy, he or she might select a move where the water in the larger and the medium jugs will have amounts close to the goal state. So he or she pours water from the large jug into the medium one and now one has 3 ounces of water in each of the large jugs and 5 ounces of water in the middle jug. This is certainly closer to the goal than was in the initial state. But this hill climbing strategy does not lead to success in this case. A more demanding strategy is mean scent analysis. Mean sense analysis refers to comparing one's current state to the goal state and then finding a means or an operator to reduce the difference. Mean sense analysis follows three consecutive steps. First, the algorithm determines the distance between the current state and the goal state. Second, it tests whether there is an available operator that reduces the distance between the current state and the goal state. Third, the procedure jumps back to the first step. The means and analysis creates sub goals where the problem is broken into sub problems until an operator is available that can be applied. Let us understand this better by applying means and analysis to the three disk star of Hanoi where the main goal is to get all three discs on peg 3. We have already discussed about the Hanoi tar in the previous module. To accomplish this one must get the largest disc on peg 3 but in the initial state one cannot move it owing to the stated rules of puzzles where only one disc can be moved at a time and there are two discs on the larger disc. 
the larger disk cannot be placed on the smaller disk. Here one will have to try a sub goal where the medium sized disk can be first moved out of the way. But again this move is not possible as the small disk is in the way. The next sub goal then becomes to move the small disk first. The question to ponder over here is that in this process goals and sub goals are being set until the entire problem is solved. One of the other heuristic strategies that is often used in problem solving is using analogies. As a student, have you ever tried to solve a problem, especially in mathematics, assigned for home task by finding a similar problem worked out in the textbook? Indeed you must have. This method of solving a problem by referring to an exemplar problem is called analogy. An analogy heuristic works on the similarities between the current problem and one solved in the past. Analogies describe similar structures and interconnect them to identify certain relations. Analogical reasoning is generally thought to comprise of five sub-processes. Retrieval of relevant information, mapping characteristics of the source onto the target, evaluating whether or not the analogy is valid for this particular problem, abstracting the relevant features shared by the source and the target, predicting characteristics of the target from what is known about the source. However, all problems cannot be solved using analogies as they sometimes create obstacles in problem solving rather than helping. This will be dealt in the next sec in the next uh, discussion. However, all problems cannot be solved using analogies as they sometimes create obstacles in problem solving rather than helping. This can be dealt much better in our next section of discussion where we are going to discuss what are the barriers to problem solving. Some problems can be solved faster and better using a working backward strategy. Here one begins at the goal state and moves backward to the unsolved initial state. You may have tried to solve the maze puzzle using this strategy where one begins from the goal point. One of the advantages of working backwards is that one starts to see the sub goals which become the milestones of achieving the final goal. Once the string of sub goals projecting backwards from the goal state are envisaged, solving the sub goals can be achieved. However, working backward is viable only when the goal state is uniquely well defined. This strategy, however, may also be employed when setting intermediate deadlines to final submissions and presentations. Do you always reach solutions to problems instantly? Does it happen that sometimes you have to struggle hard finding solutions to certain problems? Think of a problem that you may have faced and remember what strategies did you apply to solve the problems of a similar nature. Most commonly, to solve a problem, you often refer to the problems in the past. There is a human tendency to use the strategies that worked successfully in the past. We look for similarities and differences in the current problem and these solved in the past. You have already read about analogies, but sometimes previous experience of familiarity with a past problem can make problem solving more difficult rather than making it simpler. This is called fixation, where we become so habituated in trying to find solutions to problem of a similar kind that we do not attempt to think of alternate ways of solving the same problems. There are certain barriers that can hinder problem solving. Let us look at them more closely. Let us try to solve a problem. You can see in the picture there are nine dots. Try to connect all nine dots by drawing four straight lines without lifting the pen from the paper. You have to connect all the nine dots with four straight lines here. 
difficult. Sometimes because of the fact that we try to persistently find solutions to problems only through the previously successful strategies, we hinder many of the novel ways through which these problems can be solved. These are termed as mental sets. In this particular problem of the nine dots, people often try one solution after the other, but each solution is constrained by a set response, that is not to extend any line beyond the matrix. Look at the solution of the nine dot problem. As you can see, in this, one must overcome the mental sets and think out of the box. The lines are extended beyond the matrix. So to overcome mental sets, you must think outside the box. When in the nine dot problem, solution is constrained by a set response, not to extend any line beyond the matrix. The solution is not reached. To achieve the goal, one has to think differently. Another barrier to problem solving is functional fixedness. We often use objects in the traditional way and do not try to use available resources in unusual ways. It is a tendency to regard the function of objects or ideas as fixed. In other words, fixedness means thinking of an object as only functioning in its usual way. To understand this better, let us take the example of an imaginary situation. In one of the situation, one of the two friends gave up constructing a model of a tree house as they did not have a pair of scissors to cut a long thread short. But one of the other friends tried to create friction by rubbing, rubbing the thread on the corner of a wall. As a result of it, the thread broke into two parts which could now be used for the tree house. Simply, the wall was not just seen in its conventional role. Functional fixedness and mental sets became the key concepts of gestaltists to explain why productive thinking indeed impeded creative and insightful problem solving. Along with these, confirmation bias, where we prefer information that confirms pre-existing positions or beliefs while ignoring contradictory evidence and response set, which is responding in familiar ways to obstruct problem solving. It is therefore important to be flexible while solving problems. We know that problem solving is one of the fundamental human cognitive processes. As a higher cognitive process, problem solving interacts with many other cognitive processes such as perception, encoding, searching, abstraction, learning, decision making, inferences and analysis on the basis of internal knowledge representation. All these cognitive processes along with problem solving are a function of the brain. The brain searches a solution for a given problem and finds a path to the solution. It can be seen as a search process in the memory space and set of alternative paths. A number of different types of cognitive processes and different steps are involved in problem solving. Research on brain and problem solving claims that many different parts of the brain are involved in problem solving using PET, ERP, fMRI techniques. With both brain damaged and healthy participants, investigators have sought to discover how areas in the brain support problem solving. Using a modified version of the Tower of Hanoi, investigators found that brain activation in the right dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, bilateral parietal cortex and bilateral premotor cortex increased as the task became more complex. These regions have strong influence on the working memory and executive processes. Patients find frontal lobe lesions find it difficult 
to solve the problem of Henoitar using means and analysis. Further, the brain recalls and remembers previous experiences and finds analogies with problems previously solved by the brain. Thus we conclude that problem solving is a complex human cognitive process. Human problem solving can be best understood by understanding the dynamic interplay between problems and goal representations, the processes of problem solving, contextual factors and other cognitive factors such as the role of working memory, perception, encoding and so forth. A problem can be approached in two different ways. When an individual reproduces the response to a given problem based on his or her past experience, it is called reproductive thinking. Reproductive thinking involves arriving at the solution of a problem by taking a tried and true path to the problem. By using rote memory, the thinker reproduces a series of steps that have been tried and tested to yield a workable solution to the problem. Kohler distinguished between this trial and error thinking and insight-based thinking in problem solving. In the second way, called the productive thinking, it requires something new and different to achieve the goal. Here, prior learning is not of help and one has to think something non-obvious to solve the problem. This type of thinking is called productive thinking, which requires insight and creativity. One of the important goals of research on problem solving has been to identify strategies to use when we are confronted with problems. There are two key methods to problem solving, algorithms and heuristics. An algorithm is a rule that correctly generates the solution to a problem given that one can devote sufficient time and effort to applying the rule. Two general algorithms are trial and error and systematic search. In trial and error, solutions are randomly tried until the goal is reached. To understand systematic search, consider this example. If one wishes to solve anagrams for CTA, an algorithm to solve this will be to try every possible letter in every possible position until the word solution is reached. Thus, in systematic search, every letter in every position in an anagram is tried systematically. This brings us to the second type of search method called heuristics. Heuristics refers to a rule of thumb or a general strategy that may lead to a solution reasonably quickly with less computation cost. A heuristic for solving anagrams is to look for sequences of letters that occur frequently in English such as 
ISM, ISM, etc. The second is to remove rarely occurring combinations and build on the knowledge of how words are combined and put together to make meaningful utterances. Let us look at the commonly used problem solving heuristics. These include random search, hill climbing, mean sense analysis and analogies. Let us try to understand them better. Random search is the simplest and cognitively one of the least demanding of all heuristic methods. Here, the problem solver randomly picks up a move and tests to see whether the goal state is achieved. You may have observed this when you play the game of cards, where cards are laid in form of a mat and the players have to match similar cards by picking up one card at a time. Often children use random search strategy in matching the cards. Hill climbing is a knowledge dependent heuristic where the problem solvers looks one move ahead and chooses the move that most closely resembles the goal state. Means ends analysis refers to comparing one's current state of the goal state and then finding a means or an operator to reduce the difference. Means ends analysis follows three consecutive steps. First, the algorithm determines the distance between the current state and the goal state. Second, it tests whether there is an available operator that reduces the distance between the current state and the goal state. Third, the procedure jumps back to the first step. The means and analysis creates sub-goals where the problem is broken into sub-problems until an operator is available that can be applied. One of the other heuristic strategies that is often used in problem solving involves solving a particular problem by referring to an exemplar problem. This is called analogy. An analogy heuristics works on the similarities between the current problem and one solved in the past. Analogies describe similar structures and interconnect them to identify certain relations. Some problems can be solved faster and better using a working backward strategy. Here one begins at the goal state and moves backward to the unsolved initial problem. Do you always reach solutions to problems instantly? Does it happen that sometimes you have to struggle hard finding solutions to certain problems? There are certain factors that hinder problem solving. Most commonly, we look for similarities and differences in current problems and those solved in the past. But sometimes, previous experiences or familiarity with the past problem can make problem solving more difficult rather than making it simpler. This is called fixation, where we become so habitual in trying to find solutions to problem of a similar kind that we do not attempt to think of alternate ways of solving the same problems. When we try to persistently find solutions to problems only through the previously successful strategies, we hinder 
any novel ways of finding solutions to problems. This is called mental sets. To overcome mental sets, you must think outside the box. Another barrier to problem solving is functional fixedness. We often use objects in the traditional way and do not try to use available resources in unusual ways. It is a tendency to regard the function of objects or ideas as fixed. Along with these, confirmation bias, where we prefer information that confirms pre-existing positions or beliefs while ignoring contradictory evidence and response set, which is responding in most familiar ways, also obstruct problem solving. Problem solving is one of the fundamental human cognitive processes. As a higher cognitive process, problem solving interacts with many other cognitive processes such as perception, encoding, searching, abstraction, learning, decision making, inferences, and analysis on the basis of internal knowledge representation. All these cognitive processes, along with problem solving, are a function of the brain. The brain searches a solution for a given problem or finds a path to the solution. Research on brain and problem solving claims that different parts of the brain are involved in problem solving. To summarize, reproductive thinking involves arriving at the solution of a problem by trying a tried and true path to the problem. Productive thinking requires insight and creativity. There are two key methods to problem solving, algorithms and heuristics. An algorithm is a rule that correctly generates the solution to a problem given that one can devote sufficient time and effort to applying the rule. A heuristic refers to a rule of thumb or a general strategy that may lead to a solution reasonably quickly with less computation cost. Commonly used problem solving heuristics are random search, hill climbing, means and analysis and analogies. Restricting oneself to finding solutions to problems in habitual ways and not attempting alternate ways of thinking about the same problems is termed fixation in problem solving. Mental sets, functional fixedness, confirmation bias hinder creative problem solving. Research on brain and problem solving claim that different parts of the brain are involved in problem solving.